we were woefully unprepared for all virtual instruction. Roughly one in six school-age kids lived in a home that did not have access to high-speed internet, according to a Pew Research Center analysis of 2015 census data. Many more lacked adequate devices, and many teachers didn't have reliable online access. School districts stepped in, handing out hotspots, Chromebooks, laptops, anything to help students and staff get into the digital classroom. The federal government provided billions of dollars to help implement virtual instruction. But now we are at a critical point. What will happen to those families, staff members, and even schools once the pandemic is over? Do we have a long-term solution to the broadband question? And has, the, has access to the internet and virtual learning become a civil rights issue? With us to help unpack those questions, we have a great panel. We're joined by Deputy Secretary of Commerce, Don Graves, Senator Ben Lujan of New Mexico, Deputy Secretary of Education, Cindy Martin, Acting FCC Commissioner, Jessica Rosenmorsel, and Becky Pringle, a middle school science teacher and the president of the National Education Association. We're also lucky to have Roman Trejo, a student at St. Xavier University in Chicago, and Shauna Mottwright, a high school drama and speech teacher at Memorial High School in Tulsa and the president of the Tulsa Education Association. We'll start with Deputy, Deputy Secretary of Commerce Graves. De Deputy Secretary Graves, before the pandemic, the general public heard very little about the role broadband access played in education. How have you seen that play out and what are you doing to expand broadband access for all American families? Well, th thanks so much, Allison, for that uh, great introduction and for the, the question. Before I answer, I do wanna thank uh, Senator Lujan, who's been a champion on these issues for for many years. Thank you for joining us in the round table along with my friend and partner, Deputy Secretary Martin, uh, FCC Acting Chair Rosenworcel, who is a close partner, FCC is a close partner of commerce on these issues. And of course, President Pringle of the NEA. We truly appreciate your leadership in this effort to bring high-speed affordable internet, internet access to every American household. And I would be remiss if I didn't also thank Shauna and Roman for taking the time to share your personal views, your personal experiences about this critical issue. Well, you know, Allison, it's in our increasingly digital world, broadband access and affordability, importantly, isn't a luxury. It's essential to everyday life. The pandemic has exposed to all of us how wide the digital divide is in the United States, you know, how, how truly uh, big that gulf is. And even before the pandemic, lack of access to affordable high-speed internet had created deep educational inequities across all of the communities in the U.S. More than 35% of rural Americans today lack wired access to broadband at adequate speeds. And roughly half of households on tribal lands access, uh, have access to high-speed affordable internet. Even if we connected everyone in rural America tomorrow, there'd still be more than 20 million households in urban areas that would lack access. So, you know, in fact, 80% of households lack an, lacking an internet connection at home are in urban areas as of 2019, according to uh, our National Telecommunications and Information Administration. So while some of these households are in places where high quality broadband is unavailable, they're much more likely to be offline because it's not affordable or because they don't have the right digital uh, equipment or the right digital skills. So as I said, the pandemic only exacerbated the digital divide as Americans relied on broadband for jobs, for school, for telemedicine. And as Vice President Harris said, when people are cut off from high-speed internet, they're also cut off from opportunity. It means fewer opportunities to work from home, attend school online, remotely visit their doctors, or stay connected with family and friends. I, I was out talking with uh, some folks in, in a more rural area, and they were sharing their experiences, these, these parents, of uh, their experience of their kids uh, during the pandemic. Parents should never, should never again be put in a position where due to lack of access to broadband, they need to decide which of their children gets to go to school online that day. That shouldn't happen in the United States of America. No student should ever be forced to sit in a parking lot at a, at a library or a restaurant 
uh, to access their internet to attend school or finish their homework. That's not something that we should have in this country. Access to affordable broadband isn't just important for education, it's also key to US competitiveness. It's important for workforce development and getting Americans back to work. President Biden understands this, which is why he's made investments in broadband a priority for this administration as part of the Build Back Better agenda. Universal broadband access is also a top priority here at the Department of Commerce. And the secretary and I are working hard to ensure that historic expansion of high-speed internet uh, it occurs to every American uh, across the country through the, the infrastructure bill. And we're hoping that we, get, we can make that bill a reality in the coming days. As of last week, many of you have heard, we're one step closer with the Senate passing the bill, thanks to uh, Senator Lujan's leadership, which calls for an investment of $65 billion to make high-speed broadband available to all Americans, to bring down high-speed internet prices across the board and to close the digital divide. This is the type of transformational federal investment that will create jobs and opportunities. It's gonna increase productivity, and most importantly, it'll improve the lives of every American, particularly those in urban communities and rural communities that have been too often left behind. Our roundtable discussion today, I think, uh, features really important, uh, important voices in this discussion. I'm looking forward to the conversation on how broadband uh, uh, drives uh, our educational development and attainment and the challenges that folks are facing across the nation. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back to you, Allison. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on to Senator Lujan. Uh, Senator Lujan, what do you see as the legislative role here? How much of a part should Congress play in providing connectivity to underserved communities? Well, Allison, thank you so much for the question and to each and every one of our friends that are on here, I wanna say thank you as well to the work that Deputy Secretary Graves is doing, Deputy Secretary Martin, um, someone that I respect very much that has coined the term, close the homework gap. And that's our chair of the FCC, Commissioner Rosenworcel. Um, I think that we need to unleash the work that the commissioner can do. And I hope to get a fifth FCC commissioner uh, to help you with that, Jessica. Uh, President Pringle, always an honor to be with you. And then the stories I think that are gonna be profound today, I look forward to hearing from Shauna and from Roman. So thank you both for being with us. Uh, so look, Allison, to get to your question, I think there's an important role that the legislative branch, the House and the Senate have to play to be able to eliminate the homework gap um, and to connect everyone across America with fast, affordable, reliable internet. Now I'm gonna share with you a little bit from a New Mexico perspective. I'm proud to be a United States Senator here from New Mexico and also chair the subcommittee on the Commerce Committee that has jurisdiction uh, over broadband connectivity over the FCC and making sure we get this right. New Mexico state constitution requires that every public school student in New Mexico has equal access to education. So today that means providing equitable access to technology, including connected computers and reliable affordable internet. So it's my job to make sure we deliver here in New Mexico and work with our governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham. But here's a story I want you to hear. Um, a student that I had a chance to meet, 16 years old, Helene Archuleta, she's a student at Cuba High School, uh, lives on the Navajo Nation uh, in Counselor in New Mexico, and she lacks reliable broadband to do her homework. She's a dedicated student and she will become a nurse technician. And I have no doubt that she'll be a role model for other students in her community. But at home, she has intermittent internet access provided through the state of New Mexico with a wireless hotspot. And it's intermittent because one, she doesn't have electricity to her home nor running water, which are also issues we have to face and solve. She also faces a one and a half hour bus ride to school each way. It's why I think we should also get Wi-Fi on school buses. Now with a historic $7.1 billion investment made by the Emergency Connectivity Fund in the American Rescue Plan, Congress passed back in March, students and schools across New Mexico were able to better serve students like Colleen and help them achieve their dreams. The American Rescue Plan's fiscal recovery funds to tribal, state, and local governments will also enable these governments like the Navajo Nation to invest in broadband infrastructure to reach more students. Now the $65 billion included in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that the Senate passed this month made the emergency broadband benefit permanent. 
that commitment to broadband affordability and the bill's $42 billion to build high-cost broadband infrastructure will help close the homework gap. But I think Congress still needs to double down and do more. Every student in New Mexico, every student in America deserves access to fast, affordable internet. And here in New Mexico, sadly, we know the difference between fast, slow, and no internet. So we need to make sure we get equitable speeds, equitable costs, redundant, resilient, secure broadband to every student across the country. And by some estimates, that will cost maybe $5 billion in my state alone. So Congress's part to play is far from over. And New Mexico students deserve the opportunity to reach their full potential, regardless of where they live. And that applies to every student across America. So just in closing, as the chair of the Senate Commerce Committee Subcommittee on Communications, Media and Broadband, I'm committed to working with each and every one of you to make this possible and just appreciate this conversation. Uh, let's go out there and solve this problem. I know we can get it done. And now we have the investment to begin to eliminate these challenges. Thanks, Allison. Thank you. Thanks for that thoughtful answer. Um, our next question is for Deputy Secretary Martin. Uh, Deputy Secretary Martin. When schools switched to remote learning in March of 2020, it exposed inequities in access that we've all known about for some time. You were working as the San Diego superintendent at the time. How does your experience as an educator and superintendent inform how are you, you are working to tackle this issue now that you're at the US Department of Education? Thank you so much for that question, Allison, and I appreciate the ability and to be able to join everybody today and my colleagues on this call the vision that we're setting and real action that goes with it is really at the heart of how we can use this moment in time to be better and do better on behalf of our students. And so when I think about equity, which is at the heart of how we need to address and tackle this, equity means that every single student gets what he or she needs when they need it and in the way that they need it. And when it comes to access, that is very different for each student, depending on their locality and the things that they need at their fingertips to be able to succeed. So, you know, like 18 months ago, with almost no warning, as you all know, we had to figure out how we were going to have continuity of learning in these unprecedented circumstances. And not only continuity of learning, but actually food delivery services, our students needed access to meals. So continuity of food and nutrition services, continuity of learning, how are we gonna ensure that we were gonna reach all students and not just reach them, but reach them effectively and equitably. San Diego Unified had over 100,000 students and 16,000 employees. And what I can tell you is that great educators, and I have my colleague Becky on this call, great educators know that if you can't reach them, you can't teach them. And we used to say that as teachers in brick and mortar schools for years. And all of a sudden, this problem had actually become literal and it become literal all over the country. If we can't reach them, we can't teach them. And we literally needed to reach them. And I'm talking about students that were in living in homeless shelters or in major transitions based on what was happening. So I gotta say that in San Diego, the lessons that we learned immediately were that leadership matters. And that's while a pandemic might change how we do business, it wasn't going to change what our core mission was and what our core beliefs are. And so you have to think about, yes, we absolutely had to change the how of our work, but we did not change our core beliefs around teaching and learning and equity. And not only does each student need to get what he or she needs when they need it in the way that they need it, but each educator, everybody that was serving our students, people needed access to things to be able to have a service delivery model that changed literally on a dime. So there was a lot of leadership and we had to be very purposeful and intentional in the work that we did to deal with this digital divide and like close it with scotch tape and bubble gum. Like we gotta close this thing and we gotta close it fast. And I don't wanna just close it short term. If we close this digital divide, it needs to be closed and never opened again. And so the questions we ask ourselves is how do we ensure a delivery of service that's long-term, that's in every community and that we not only know our students by name and by need, but we know our communities. What does each community need to be live its best life and to give its members of its community what they need to be successful? I know in San Diego, we were lucky because we had a little bit of a head start because prior to this pandemic, San Diego had passed three successful bond measures and we were able to expand fiber and ensure access to broadband and make available one-to-one -one devices for each student 
We already had one-to-one -one devices in the classrooms. We just had to figure out how to get those off the charging carts and get them home with chargers and headphones and distribution. And San Diego is a military town, so we know how to do big logistics and operations. And we got 80,000 Chromebook computers passed out in record time and hot spots if they were needed. But that was the ingenuity. And, and we had a little bit of a head start because we already had the computers. And I'm not saying everybody has to do what San Diego did. And not every district had the beginning of an infrastructure in place to transition to remote learning immediately like we did. But I want to challenge us to envision a world in which a child learns, where a child learns matters less. Can we imagine a world in which your demography doesn't determine your destiny? Can we imagine a world where locality and modality will never matter when it comes to reaching and teaching our students? In San Diego, we were able to pivot on a dime thanks to this longstanding commitment that we had to equity in a very diverse, large urban core district. We had strong community partners, we had long-term investments, but what does that look like at the national level? School by school, community by community, child by child, family by family. So that's what's important about this moment. The pandemic, as we know, exposed and not only exposed, but exacerbated the gaps. And it has had a disproportionate toll on students of color, students with disabilities, and multilingual learners. So I will say that we cannot allow these historic gaps to grow even wider. That's why this administration is using every tool at our disposal to advance ec educational equity in student opportunities and student outcomes. We have a chance at this moment to reinvent access, equity, and connectivity in American education for generations to come. This isn't a quick fix, short term, get through the pandemic and go back. We have a chance to reinvent this. We've had a historic recovery investments through the American Rescue Plan and the Build Back Better agenda would work to close the digital divide across America. And that would be including in communities where access to the internet has an impact. It impacts student outcomes and we can change that. We should approach our mission as educators and as leaders in this education space to meet the needs of all students. And we need to use, as every good teacher knows, a strengths-based approach and build on lessons learned. You need to pay attention to what's working to get more of what's working. During this time, we reached our families that we might not have ever reached otherwise. Parents whose work schedules didn't allow them to come to parent-teacher conferences in the past, or they had language barriers that we were able to overcome with quick Zoom meetings and increased translation services. And so many students with disabilities had a chance to practice and gain some hard skills at home. And those hard skills are gonna help them with their cognitive and social engagement when they return to the classrooms. And schools, as always, became the critical neighborhood centers for students and families and other members of the community because we were providing meals and services and vaccinations and testing and so much more as the heart and the hub of the community. So yes, there were lessons learned. There was a lot of wisdom gained and there were connections that were made during the pandemic. Let's leverage and use those connections because we have a chance to invest in the long-term institutionalization of the good that has come of this. So we can continue to narrow the existing disparities, expand equity, and let's connect students to each other and to learning more than ever. That's at the heart of the Build Back Better agenda. Thanks for letting me join this today. Thank you. Um, and now we'll turn to acting Chairwoman Rosenworcel, who as Senator Lujan said, actually coined the term homework app to describe the problem of inequitable access to high-speed internet and devices long before the pandemic. Acting Commissioner Rosenworcel, uh, the FCC has been in a position to, uh, to help plug the gaps around access to broadband. Can you tell us how you've tried to address the problem? Sure, well, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me here today. Everyone on this panel is a dynamo, and it's a privilege to join you. Uh, you mentioned the homework gap. It's something that I've spent a lot of time on over the years. And it really comes down to this. When I was growing up, I needed three things to do my nightly schoolwork. I needed paper, a pencil, and my brother leaving me alone. And that last one was the hard part. But those days are over. Every teacher knows it. Every educator knows it. 
We found data that suggested that seven in 10 teachers assign homework now that requires internet access. But FCC data repeatedly show that one in three households do not subscribe to broadband. So where those numbers overlap is what we started calling the homework gap because it's such an important part of the digital divide and it deserves attention. These are the kids that struggle with nightly schoolwork. Just getting their regular homework is done is difficult. And then we go to this pandemic. These were the same kids who got locked out of the virtual classroom because they didn't have the internet access at home they needed to fully participate in class. There were some studies done of how many students were impacted. We saw studies that suggested as many as 17 million. These were the kids who were sitting outside the fast food restaurant trying to catch a Wi-Fi signal just to go to class. And they have tremendous grit. I have no doubt they're gonna be successful if they were trying to keep up with their schoolwork that way. But it just seems to me in the United States of America, we can commit right here and right now to making sure every student, no matter who they are, where they live, or where they came from, has the connectivity they need to succeed in school. And what makes me proud right now is after so many years of talking about the homework gap and this distinct part of the digital divide, we now have two big programs in place that can help this year. We've got the emergency broadband benefit at the FCC. This is the nation's largest ever broadband affordability program that can help households that have a Pell Grant or a student on the free and reduced lunch program get discounted broadband at home so they don't fall into that homework gap and they can keep up with class. And we've also got this amazing new fund called the Emergency Connectivity Fund, thanks to folks like Senator Lujan. And what that does is it goes straight to the libraries and schools themselves and supports them when they need to purchase equipment for connectivity to get those kids connected at home. So I have some optimism we can use these two programs to make a meaningful dent in the homework gap. But when we get to the other side of this crisis and we can put this virus behind us, I don't think we're gonna revert back to what was. We're gonna to continue to use connectivity in the ways we teach. We're gonna to continue to need to make sure that every student is connected. So I hope we can use this moment to commit as a nation to getting 100% of our households connected and 100% of our students connected. Because I think if we do that, we will give everyone a fair shot at an equitable education. And uh, it might've taken a crisis to refocus us on the homework gap, but I think we are now in a position to make that a priority. And I hope when we look back on these times, we say we solved the homework gap and we did a lot to address the digital divide because I think that's gonna be generational change for education, our economy and our civic life. And I think we are, thanks to Congress, we have new tools to make that happen. Thank you. Uh, next we'll hear from NEA President, Becky Pringle. Uh, President Pringle, can you talk about the importance of broadband and connectivity in helping to ensure that vulnerable students have access to the resources they need? Uh, so uh, thank you, Allison, and uh, I want to thank uh, my fellow panelists who have joined me. Uh, this is quite an incredible collection of powerful people. And in Deputy Secretary Graves and, and Martin and, and Acting Chairwoman Rosen Wurzel, um, uh, what they are demonstrating in this moment is the the kind of interagency collaboration that honestly the NEA um, uh, uh, called on the Biden administration to, to uh, really promote. Because for us at the NEA, for educators all over this country, for our students, it takes all of us. We know that the issues and challenges and opportunities that our students um, face and need we will not address them individually. We can't, sec uh, Deputy Secretary Martin can't address it only in the Department of Education. I can't address it only from the National Education. We have to do it all together because if our students can't eat, they can't learn. If they're not healthy, they can't learn. If they don't have access to the internet, they cannot learn. 
And so all of us coming together in this space is absolutely critical. We need to continue to do that. Having our, our student and educator with us in this space to tell us what's happening on the ground with real students in real schools, real educators is absolutely essential to this, this conversation. So I taught middle level learners the wonders of science for over 30 years. And so as I think about the role that we must play in this moment to ensure that every one of our students has the access and opportunity they need and deserve to not only succeed, but to actually be those critical thinkers, those problem solvers that we need them to be, to ultimately become the leaders of a just society. Of course, of course, they need access to the internet. I, our, our acting uh, chairwoman talked about coining the term homework app, and we really leaned into that at the NEA, as she knows. Uh, and ironically, we had convened um, um, uh, over 60 organizations in February of 2020, right before we all went to virtual. We had convened them to talk about the homework app. And what we were going to do collectively as a group to advocate for the resources we needed to close that gap. And here we are. So it no longer is only a homework gap. It is a learning gap. And it especially is true for those vulnerable uh, uh, communities and students, populations that have always been adversely impacted. So we know that our black and brown and indigenous students who, have, who, were, who were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and the crisis it spawned were disproportionately impacted by this gap. We know that many of them did not have the access and even when they had the access with parents also drawing on uh, that same resource that some of them had to share tools in homes we know that they did not have the full access that they, they needed. It's one of the reasons why NEA did a uh, report and released a report uh, uh, called Digital Equity at, for Students and Educators. And we uh, did something uh, uh, differently with our report. We, we talked about it nationally, but we also talked about it state by state. And then we drilled down and we talked about regions so that we could highlight uh, the disproportionate impact of not having inter internet access and broadband for rural communities communities, as well as uh, by race and economic status. And I don't think anyone joining us here knows what we found, that those most vulnerable students and communities were the ones that uh, did not have access to broadband, did not have access to the internet or tools to, uh, to use uh, that access, even if they had limited access. Uh, and so I encourage you to find out uh, more about what's happening in your individual uh, neck of the woods so that you can be those advocates we need you to be. I had an opportunity to visit some teachers in uh, Baltimore County a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things they said to me was, Becky, you know, um, we've learned a lot. As, as uh, Deputy Secretary Martin said, we've learned a lot over this year. And one of the things we know is that even though we all know that in-person learning is the best learning for our students, there are so many things we learned about how we're gonna use uh, virtual learning even when our students are in person with us, in addition to when they, they go home. And, and what they said to us is, Becky, what we need is greater access. What we need is better tools. What we need is more training and technology. That's what we need because we want to bring forward those learnings, especially for our most vulnerable students. And so we know that this is an issue of equity and access based on race and social socioeconomic status and geography. And we must come together to ensure when we say every student, we actually mean every student is prepared to succeed in a diverse and interdependent world. Thank you. Uh, and now we'll hear from a student, uh, Roman Trejo, who is a student at St. Xavier University. Uh, Roman, what kind of connectivity do you have right now at school and at home? Um, and what kinds of challenges did you have in accessing broadband during the pandemic? Why do you think this is gonna be important for all students going forward? So I think the best part about my connection issues um, is that throughout this entire panel, I got the constant message, um, your internet connection's unstable. 
So even now, as far as we are into the pandemic, nothing has changed for me. Um, I'm really happy to see that uh, students K through 12 had received assistance from their schools and their educators. But as a college student, um, no one came for our help. <laughs> uh, we talk often a lot from my peers that we would have to go to Starbucks and they weren't allowing in dine in room dining. So we would sit in the car, which was fun, you know, doing our assignments out in the car, but there was a consciousness of safety to help. Should we even be seeing each other in the first place? And so once people started getting it more locally in our area, we all started to separate ourselves. Um, our school had eventually opened it back up for us to use internet, um, but it was not in the building. So we had to sit in our cars. Um, so that's just a small scale of some of the connectivity issues that I faced beyond literally driving to McDonald's. I did that um, <clears throat> and begging family members who also didn't have internet, which I later found out. So this connectivity issue was much more widespread and more personal than I thought. Um, and there's a joke about me in the NEA aspiring educators that I have the worst internet access of all time. So of course, when the pandemic had occurred, my already very unstable internet could not handle constant Zoom meetings, constant um, use with now my mom doing things and then life happened. So that was something that was very frustrating for me to kind of tackle. And the kind of other challenges that I did have to access was for some time I did lose my internet connection altogether. Um, my mother was laid off from her job of 30 years during the pandemic. And so I had to kind of pick up some of the slack and get to work. And I'm still working full time. So there are um, some other challenges that were not necessarily contingent on um, internet connection, but also the wider issue at hand that the pandemic really scaled back a lot of the things that were kind of working and then they kind of just left altogether. So I think moving forward, I think the most important idea that I think our legislators and everyone needs to hold closely is that this isn't a single issue, that a lot of the issues that I experience as a low-income first-generation college student, um, it's a wholesome problem or there needs to be a wholesome solution where it addresses our economic crisis, our connectivity crisis and accessibility, our racial social justice issues, which plays a big part to why me in my area, I cannot get access to great high quality speed internet, but my peers who live in Crestwood or Orland Park can. There's a wholesome solution here that really needs to be looked at, but that's my view at least. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm glad your internet is working well enough that we're able to, uh, to connect with you today. Uh, my next question is for Shauna Mottwright, who is a high school drama and speech teacher in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, Shauna, can you tell us how did broadband connectivity help you access your students during the pandemic? Um, and how do you feel like it's going to make a difference going forward? Yeah, um, thank you so much for having me and that I get to be a part of this incredible panel. I want to tell everyone, my colleagues were so excited that we were being asked to tell our story instead of someone else driving the narrative about our stories. So again, thank you for that. It means a lot. Uh, broadband connectivity was really key in allowing all of us to connect with our kids, having that adequate internet access, um, both as a teacher and for our kids meant that we could expect to see about half of our students on a consistent daily basis. Uh, the more reliable their connection, the more information they were able to receive, and the more they were able to participate in class. Without broadband, we wouldn't have been able to do anything. We wouldn't have been able to connect with our students at all, not the way we did. Uh, broadband today, in this day and age, with everything we've seen and heard of, which I just want to say like a big amen to everything everyone on the panel said so far, it just resonates so deeply. And it feels good to know that not only are we not alone as educators, that, that we're not alone, period, that people are recognizing things and wanting to take action with us hand in hand to fix this for, for our students, for what needs to happen. So in this day and age, it should be considered a utility. It's, it's necessary. Um, one of my teachers here in Tulsa, 
I'm a Tulsa teacher elected by Tulsa teachers to represent them. So I'm president of Tulsa Classroom Teachers Association. So while I'm a teacher and can give you my feedback, I also reached out to all of my teachers and asked them and listened to what they had to say. So one of them, Lisa, she lives in a rural area. She teaches in Tulsa, which we're like the Chicago of Oklahoma, and I love it. I went to school here. My two kids are in school here, but she lives in a rural area. They only have one option for internet there. And so she struggled really hard to teach um, while doing distance learning. She had to get special permission to be at her school, to be able to Zoom with her kids. And one of our support employees called me one day just crying because she didn't have anything available to her. And so she had to go sit in a parking lot and try to connect as did her five children. Broadband is beyond important. You know, I'm a speech drama debate teacher and I don't have the words to articulate or emphasize the importance of what it meant to us and what it will mean going forward. It kept us going and kept us in touch with our students. And I just wanna say our state president has talked about like, if you think of the school, like the rooftop opening, all of these inequities we knew as educators, but it was like a magnifying glass was put on us and no more status quo. We cannot go back to that because all these opportunities that kids have today, that's great. My children are benefiting from those opportunities, but opportunities without access means nothing. It means nothing, it's pointless. And so we have to give that access to our children and our educators as well so that they can reach our children. Thank you for that. Uh, now I wanna open the floor to allow our Oh, Allison, you muted by accident. Apologies for that, sorry. Uh, I, I was just saying that I'm gonna open the floor up to our panelists uh, to give them a chance to follow up and also to allow our policymakers a chance to ask Roman and Shauna uh, their own questions. Um, and we're gonna start with um, Acting Commissioner Rosenworcel. Uh, oh my goodness, thank you for letting me do that. Um, first of all, it is chilling to hear these stories from our students and our teachers because the work that they've done during the last year and change to stay connected, keep up with school, it's just heart-wrenching. And um, I wanna thank them for being able to talk about it so clearly and cogently, because you're reminding people in Washington that we still have work to do. I um, am curious if the difficulties that you found that the teachers had and the students that you know had resulted from an inability to afford service or an absence of infrastructure being present. In other words, is this an issue of affordability, keeping the internet up and running? Or was it an issue of, frankly, you just can't get broadband where a student or teacher lives? Because I think both of those problems are important parts of the digital divide. And we don't solve this if we don't address both. But I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about what it looks like from where you are, which of those problems is most potent. Um, I can speak a little bit to this and then I would defer to Roman. I live in Midtown Tulsa, so we have better access than most. I have the best internet from the best internet company available in Midtown Tulsa, not rural. There were times, even during NEA board meetings, I had to yell at Colin and Kennedy, get off the Wi-Fi because I can't be on and talk and it keeps cutting out. So like, if I'm having those issues, then that just tells you the issues that other people are having. So that's an infrastructure issue because we have the best internet with the best company available. And then of course, there is the, the money issue, the cost issue, because as President Pringle alluded to, like, we have to feed our kids. My kid doesn't care about things if, if you know, you have to Maslow before you can bloom. And so that we need to feed our kids 
not just with food, but with social emotional intelligence and with giving them access to the internet. And I guess I'll jump in to say, um, I live in a highly dense, pop densely populated area, living you know, in um, the city of Blue Island right next to Chicago. I actually took it upon myself to, when I was experiencing extremely harsh internet issues before the pandemic, I did my own research um, so that I could throw it back in my peers' face. Like, it's not my fault. It's the high density population. There's a lot of us on top of each other. I live in a basement apartment. There are three other families above me and three other ones across from me. Listen, and it was all like a joke, but walking into the pandemic and seeing how it adversely affected me, it became a reality that the infrastructure and the totally um, you know, absence of such really fell hard on me as someone who did have internet. And then seeing my peers who could not afford internet, it was nice to see programs be rolled out to help them. I believe Comcast did something where they um, had given people internet and then eventually you had to pay for it but very cheaply. I was going to her house because it was better than mine. So I, I do think it's a good combination of both. But for me, particularly uh, living where I do, where you know, it's, we're literally on top of each other, it, it was highly infrastructure from what I saw that you just could not get enough broadband to work efficiently and how it should be. Thank you both for those uh, thoughtful answers. Um, next we'll hear from President Pringle who I believe needs to provide an update for us. Um, <clears throat> actually, I just wanna uh, dig into um, uh, what Ramon and, and, and Shauna talked about. Um, because it's real. So I, I really appreciate the answers to your question. I, when you asked it, Allison, I was going to just yell, yes. <laughs> uh, or Chairwoman, you asked it. Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes and. Um, uh, it, it's both of them. And so, you know, as you very well know, we, we worked really hard, um, uh, the NEA and our members, on the passage of the American Rescue Plan, and that, and that helped. Um, uh, and, and, and through uh, the funds that went directly to Department of Education and, and, and funds that were set aside. We fought really hard to get funds uh, dedicated for, for E-rate, mostly because um, the, the, the program itself, as you know, um, Chairwoman, was, was set up in a way that, that tried to address the, the inequities, mm -hmm. which is unusual. You know, the, 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 the way the program was set up. Uh, so we felt that that was the best, easiest way to really try to get at it as quickly as possible uh, and address some of the issues of, in, of inequity. Um, but these are, honestly, these are longstanding infrastructure issues that are going to take a huge investment from this country. Um, and it's going to take a while for that to happen. And so even as we, what we have been thinking a lot about and talking with the department, particularly with the Department of, of Education, but most recently with the Deputy Secretary of Commerce there, um, what are we doing in the short term also? Because, you know, my grandson's not gonna be in fourth grade, but for one year. So I need some solutions for him right now, um, uh, even as we're trying to solve those long-term solutions. So for, for, for me, it is about uh, coming together, all of us coming together to solve the problems right now as best we can. Um, whether it is, um, as, as Roman indicated, I mean, all of us, even those of us who had the access, when you had three families like I did during the pandemic, working and a third grader in third grade virtual classroom in my basement, oh my goodness, talk about issues. Get off the way, wait, wait a minute. I have a <laughs> webinar to do with the deputy secretary of commerce right now, get off. <laughs> um, it's real. So even as we're solving those problems, even as we're thinking about what we can do right now, we got to think about that long-term issue. So I just want to weigh in on the yes and uh, that, that Shauna and, and, and Ramon uh, addressed just now. Thank you for that. And I, I guess it's reassuring to hear that even the president of the National Education Association <laughs> has their own connectivity issues. Uh, Deputy Secretary Martin, I understand you have a question for Roman. Yes, thank you so much. I, I'm really loving the idea of a whole of government approach and the way that we're working across different 
what we're bringing to the table might be different, but what the outcome is, what we see is a common vision and that Build Back Better agenda is about a whole government approach. And look who's on this call, like look what we're doing to figure out how to solve this at like a micro but macro level at the same time. So for Roman, I wanna ask you, I always talk about the hope and promise of public education in America because I believe in it. This is my 32nd year in education. I was 17 years as a classroom teacher. I love teaching kindergarten and second grade. And I was a principal at an inner city school for 10 years before I was superintendent for eight years. And, and so I'm deeply committed and invested to the hope and promise of public education in America. And I want it to be grounded in equity. So I wanna ask you, what are some things that you wanna see to ensure that you, are an educator and your students as future learners, you have more equitable learning experiences because I can see you have a bright future in education, but what do you feel like you need to be able to create more equitable learning experiences for kids? Um, <clears throat> during my time in the NEA, it has taught me to look at everything through a particular lens. Um, I have truly held to myself the four core values of my uh, pre-professional program within the NEA, which is educator quality, um, community engagement, racial social justice, and political action. And I believe the big thing that I think really encompasses everything into one, even though they're all four separate core values, is racial social justice. This is something that I see as being the key solution to a lot of things where otherwise we might not see it has the same, such as like our economic disparities, the, the way that we view American history, the way that we move forward with how do we destroy these barriers to success. And I believe a lot of it really is resting in racial social justice, looking at everything through a racial social lens that we have to address particular things in America. And we have to rectify some of our past all of our past in order to move forward, especially for our students to have a fair shot between each other. Um, so that's something that I, I always tell everybody, especially even it's when I go to St. Xavier and everyone looks at me kind of crooked sometimes. It is truly something that is can be useful across every different plane, racial, social justice. They're probably sick of me saying it, but it's so true. I The, way, the reason why my internet sucks is because of my zip code. And it, my zip code is full of people where we all look the same and we all go to the same school. Listen, you guys all know, I don't have to go into detail, but I do believe a more centered focus on racial social justice and making that matter into every sense of the word, not just meaning, um, you know, we say certain things and then we don't follow through on some of our legislative promises. So it's, I think it's more so making it matter into every sense of that term, coming forward with the funding for our schools, which I'm really happy to see that is an active part of this new infrastructure deal. Um, so all in all, I'm gonna leave it at that. Racial social justice is what I need and my students deserve in order to have a more equitable and honest learning environment. Thank you so much. Um, next, Senator Lujan, I believe you have a question you want to ask Shauna. I do, but before I do that, Roman, just thank you for speaking with such clarity as well. Um, that's the true test here. What Roman just laid out is if every zip code in America has access to equitable learning, fast, affordable internet, um, and competition, you know, a, a student should be able to choose if they're going to get cable internet or internet from an uh, internet service provider or from a wireless provider. Um, they shouldn't just say, well, this is all you get. So that's the real test, Roman. We need to make sure that this gets built out across the country where it's affordable um, and accessible. And that's my question, Shauna, to you is it, with all the teachers, all the educators and families I've had a chance to visit with during the pandemic and, and now that we're still going through um, all that we are, so many teachers shared with me the challenges that they faced, the challenges their students faced, these frustrations and, and really, you know, you, you wanna talk about all of the mental and behavioral health pressures that everyone was feeling um, associated with just trying to keep their students connected. And so many teachers came to me and said, we had to um, go try to find a faster internet plan with, with faster speeds. 
Um, and that meant more money out of their pockets because it wasn't affordable. And then some um, uh, teachers that lived in rural areas, they were subjected to data caps. So, you know, they were charged, you know, 10 times what they should be, um, which makes no sense. I think we should get rid of data caps. That's another project we could work on. But my, my question to you is with all these challenges I heard from teachers, fatigue, challenges, pressure um, uh, that they were carrying um, during this pandemic. So can you share with me how broadband contributed to that or lack thereof? And then also, what do you think that we can do in the United States House and Senate working with the uh, president and really government at all levels to combat the growing shortages of teachers that we're seeing in schools across the country as well? Thank you for the question. So I'm going to do a bit of preaching to the choir because I really uh, love and appreciate this panel, but we've got to get more people in the boat with us rowing in the same direction instead of against each other. Broadband, while it is very crucial and how we were able to reach our students, it also caused a lot of burnout. You know, we already had a massive teacher shortage and now that's become its own epidemic. Um, one teacher in a classroom cannot keep up with the emails and the communication tool tasks sent to us continuously, every moment from so many different people in different departments all over. And one of my teachers said, I often wonder if anyone ever stops to think about how many different angles we're hit with all day long. And, and that's true. And I understand people don't know what they don't know, but we've got to tell them. Like I said, we can't close the schoolhouse back. We can't go back to the status quo. We have to continue to shine a light and move forward so that our kids can have progress. And Becky mentioned her grandchild, which she always does, but it made me think all of our kids today are the age they are today. They will not be this age tomorrow, developmentally. Every day they're growing and we will never get this day back. And so we need to think of that in terms of broadband and access to those opportunities. So it made us able to educate the kids during the worst of the worst and what is seems to be coming back to us again where we're going to need it. But because we can connect anywhere, anytime, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, we're expected to work nonstop by everyone. Um, one of my teachers said from hero to expendable in six months, got it. That's how the majority of us feel. And when we set boundaries, we're the bad guys, yet boundaries and respect and respect comes in various forms is what's needed to stop, to put a tourniquet, so to speak, on the massive educator shortage. Congress needs to start with compensating teachers at a federal level in conjunction with state dollars, you know, because not all of us are proud of our governor. Not all of us can trust um, people that have been put in office and not all of us voted for them and in fact worked for others, but it doesn't always go that way. During her run for president, Vice President Harris had a great plan for closing the pay gap between teachers and other professions. Her plan was to ride up to $3 from the federal government for every dollar states paid additional to teachers and the starting salary across the country was 60,000. I know in some places that might not be anything here in Oklahoma. Woohoo! That'd be amazing. <laughs> and so I think that would really be a great start in making teachers feel respected and valued in their work. We have to do certain things in order to become certified professionals. We take our job incredibly seriously because it's your babies, our babies, those are our kids. And over 90% of American children attend public school. So that is society as well and affects all the families working now. And that's what our society will be when we're gone. So to say it matters is the understatement of the millennia. And I also want to say back to getting more people in the boat rowing with us. I was able to lobby on the Hill for the E-rate program. One of our congressmen is the poster child for why he should have not only voted for it, but been a co-author and spoke to it. He told me his personal story about he and his family and the connectivity issues they have, but instead wanted to play party politics. We've got to stop that mess and do what's best for kids. Thank you so much. Um, and now we'll turn yeah, to quickly, Allison. I just want to say to Senator, the Senator, all that we've talked about, the issues around equity and access, the social, the racial and social justice issues. Um, play squarely here in what in Shauna's answer. The disparate impact on teachers of color of everything we just said, 
means they're leaving at a disparate rate, leaving the profession at a disparate rate. So we need to pay attention to that and absolutely address it as we think about the teacher shortage. This is very real. Thank you. Now, that's an important point. Um, now we'll turn to Deputy Secretary Graves for some quick closing remarks. Well, thanks so much, Allison. And it's, it's, it's hard to, to close when uh, you have such amazing people who've spoken on this panel. Uh, I want to thank especially uh, Roman and Shauna for uh, your comments, your input, fantastic job. And just to, to build off of, uh, off of Shauna, what, what you said, and, and partially to talk a little bit about the question that was in the chat just a little while ago, uh, and, and one of the questions that was raised in the Q&A. Um, what we're talking about today is, it has been focused on the, uh, on the infrastructure bill that passed the Senate, which includes the $65 billion uh, to focus on, uh, on broadband, on broadband deployment, on making certain that every uh, person in the country, every community have access, has access to the internet. But the broader, question, the broader issue is, as you've heard from Roman and Shauna and President Pringle, this isn't just an issue of broadband access. We have to recognize that we're talking about people. We're talking about our children. We're talking about uh, communities. And so we have to think about this more broadly. And that's why there's the other part of the, the, the rest of the president's agenda, the Build Back Better agenda, which includes the American Families Plan. And that's talking about things like paid family and medical leave. It's like talking about, uh, about access to quality, affordable childcare. It's making sure that the teachers are able to get to their jobs because they're getting paid uh, what, what they should be paid. And they also, they have family members, children that they uh, have to leave at home or, or their parents that they have to care for. So we have to pass this comprehensive uh, agenda to make sure that we're dealing with all of the issues that, that our communities are, are facing. But just to, to go back specifically to, uh, to the infrastructure uh, bill, these investments are a crucial part of the overall effort to ensure that communities of color, as Roman had talked about, communities of color and other underserved communities are getting a fair shot at the American dream. That's what this is really, really about. And I'd be remiss if I didn't build off of what uh, the, the chairwoman mentioned with the, the two programs. We also have a, a program that is complementary to those uh, at, the, at NTIA. It's the Connecting Minority Communities Program that's directing hundreds of millions of dollars to expanding broadband access and connectivity to eligible historically black tribal and minority serving colleges and universities that we think will help per them purchase broadband service or equipment, hire IT personnel, and create digital literacy programs. So it's a way to specifically deal with the types of challenges, Roman, that you talked about. The NTIA is accepting applications right now, and that goes through uh, December 1st. So please spread the, spread the word about the Connecting Minorities, Com Minority Communities Program at NTIA. Let me just finish by saying I'm honored to work uh, with all of these amazing people, uh, and as well as the folks here at the Commerce Department. Americans are just looking for, for a fair shot. They have hopes and they have dreams, and it's our job to make sure that every person in the country, by getting access to broadband, has an opportunity to live out those hopes and those dreams and live lives of dignity. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you for your leadership, everyone on this panel. We appreciate everything that you're doing, and Allison, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much. I know I learned a lot today um, about the power of broadband. Um, and I want to thank our great panel and all of you for joining us.